Mobile technology has already blurred the lines between the digital world and the physical world, often in ways that are simultaneously horrible and magical. As new technologies like augmented reality, spatial computing, and virtual reality begin to mature and become actually useful, how will our interactions with the world and each other evolve or dissolve? And how are all of the inevitable changes of the next few years going to impact you and your loved ones? Because as it stands today, all of our realities are different. Your reality, my reality, Ginny Barncat's reality. It's been shaped by our chemistry, our biology, our lived experiences, our values. Like that cocktail of us shapes how we see the world and it shapes our personal realities. All these screens are flickering. The amount of stimulation in my brain right now is insane. But when I'm seeing people out there in the world existing today with the Apple Vision Pro, what I'm starting to realize is this is like another layer that's going to shift how we see the world. There's people in cars with this thing yep. on. There's people at lunch. There's people walking around. 3,500 bucks. This is what the future is. I'm pumped for it. When technology revolutions start, Okay, let me try to show you guys something right now. We're gonna be going through a time machine here. Yeah, this is it, this one right here. This right here is an original iPod. So it's got the mechanical scroll wheel, it's got hard physical play, pause, menu, back forward buttons. This was a technology revolution back in 2001. Boom. There it is, right there. This amazing little device holds a thousand songs. It goes right in my pocket. And this device right here, I feel like is the precursor and ultimately the inspiration for what people are now using when they're using the Apple Vision Pro. Oh my gosh, it's happening, whoa! I just set up my home to be an AR style smart home. You might not know just how magical the iPod was, but I can tell you that every time I put those little headphones inside my ear, I was transported into another world of my own creation. And the real irony is my experience with the iPod has been happening to humans generation after generation. Think about it. What are books and writing other than a way for you to be transported to another dimension to view and hear and see the thoughts and ideas of another human being? What is writing? Writing is telepathy. Now that can be a real positive because it's a way to connect with people and find people and create ideas and share things. But if you spend too much time wrapped up and connected to the world of books, you might not be making all the human and real world connections you need to be making to be happy and truly fulfilled. Isn't that right, Jenny Barncat? That doesn't just go for books. That goes for television, movies, video games, stamp collecting, and who can forget human's favorite device, the glowing rectangle, all of these things are ways for humans to get sucked into things, and humans have been doing it since the dawn of technology. And along with the humans who are getting sucked into this, there's always going to be the humans who are creating a moral panic about these things, too. Like, think back to when humans first started figuring out how to harness and use fire. I'm sure there was a combination of people excited by the fact that nighttime got a major upgrade and you were now able to cook your food versus eating that mastodon raw. But then at the same time, there were probably a lot of folks who were terrified by the fact that, yes, this stuff can burn you alive or asphyxiate you in your cave. And it's a horrible idea to use this stuff. And that constant cycle of both seeing the opportunity and upside, as well as some folks seeing the downside and casting fear and doubt. That has been part of the recipe for nearly every human being invention since the start of human beings. And yes, I know it must feel like dystopia as you doom scroll and watch all of these videos. The Vision Pros immediately created what I would call Vision Bros. We <laughs> now have a representative sample of them to look at and see what they got up to. And you can look at all of these jerk holes and say, my lord, aren't we living in a dystopia? But the reality is, it's just the cutting edge. Yet. 
double-edged cell phones. Everybody's wondering, what's Apple going to announce at the Macworld event? Rumors indicate that Apple's going to be introducing a new phone. All eyes are tuned to Macworld. Today, we're introducing three revolutionary products of this class. The first one is a widescreen iPod with touch controls. The second is a revolutionary mobile phone. And the third is a breakthrough internet communications device. An iPod, a phone, and an internet communicator. These are not three separate devices. This is one device. And we are calling it iPhone. $500 fully subsidized with a plan? I said, that is the most expensive phone in the world. And it doesn't appeal to business customers because it doesn't have a keyboard, which makes it not a very good email machine. Right now, we're selling millions and millions and millions of phones a year. Apple is selling zero phones a year. But then I fast forward to 17 years later, and this thing is like glued to all of our collective hips, so much so that we all realize we have problems. And then not only that, but I'm wearing a version of it on my wrist. I've got a bigger version of it that I use for writing. And the idea of using a glowing rectangle is not just a window into making phone calls or text messages or even looking at the internet, but rather a way that we connect and interact with the entire world has become just so commonly accepted and a part of what they're doing. We even have a label for children who are born and raised on iPads now. And that fact alone has created its own personal moral panic. First generation iPad kids are grown now and I I don't know if you know any, but it's pretty scary. There's a complete lack of social graces. I feel like she doesn't know how to do anything or function. How are these kids gonna like become people? They always get better. And so when I see all the reviews out there of people laughing at the schmucks walking their robot dogs while wearing these big bulky scuba masks, or I see all the people rolling their eyes because somebody got pulled over in their Tesla Cybertruck for driving with their Apple Vision Pro on, I can both simultaneously agree that all of those folks look stupid and that is stupid behavior, but also fully recognize that I'm gonna be doing things much like that in the not too distant future too. Today. We're not just launching a new product, we're introducing the next chapter in human-computer interaction. For years, we've worked to bring technology closer to our human experience, making it more intuitive, more natural, more personal. And today, we take the biggest leap forward yet. The Apple Vision Pro is not just a product, it's a portal, a gateway to worlds unbound by the constraints of physical reality. VR headsets are things to play games with. The Apple Vision Pro is a giant computer for your face. And so yes, I see so many parallels when I look at the response to the Apple Vision Pro as to the response that I saw with the introduction of the first iPhone. There were so many people focused on complaining about the shortcomings and the technological limitations of being an early and, and new technology that they very much were not shifting the conversation to how radically and drastically it would change our society as a whole. While Steve Jobs pitched the iPhone as the internet in your pocket, Pocket, these glowing rectangles are now our primary windows into the world. It's how you communicate with friends, loved ones, and enemies. It gives you a huge chunk of the information about the world that you now know. And heck, you and I only even have this parasocial relationship because of some sort of glowing rectangle, whether it be this one or this one, or one of those versions with keys on it, or maybe you have a TV that has like a remote. But regardless, that's the only way that 99.9% .9 of you have ever met me. And we can go on and on about how how unsettling it is to see iPad kids trying to interact with the physical world by tapping and swiping, but that's only because that technology is all they've ever known. And it's not just a technology that they've grown up with, but it's a technology that they were born into. Won't someone think of the children?
Within any society over hundreds of years, there is always a huge difference between the generations that were there before the technology versus the generations who were born after the technology. Like I, for one, was born after the computer, but even that I can flash back to a simpler time when I was like four or five years old and my dad was bringing home a new computer and I was starting to click and use it for the very first time. And even though it was bulky and beige, it was definitely blowing my mind. And as I look at how I interact with the world today, it absolutely sculpted it. Because I've been typing with keyboards since I was four years old, I'm a pretty good typist, even though I've never taken a typing class. At the same time, if anybody has ever looked at my handwriting, it would not be difficult to mistake my handwriting from the handwriting of a six-year-old. And that is because I was born into a world where the technology of typing was so readily available that I never developed the skills of handwriting. As a result, my typing skills are naturally very good, and my handwriting is absolutely absolute garbage. You know, I was also in an age where in my formative years, I was actually introduced to the internet. You know, I can think about first logging on to Prodigy to check the score of a Red Sox game when I was like 10 years old. Did you get a computer recently? Well, congratulations. You can now join hundreds of thousands who've discovered Prodigy. Connect Prodigy to your computer and get stock quotes almost as fast as a broker. Get sports scores faster than on TV shop at home. But still, I was old enough and formed enough to even have parts of my world shaped. But even then, when I compared that experience to the experience of, like, say, one of my nephews who was born into an age when tablets were in existence and readily available right from the get-go, the idea that our family only had one computer device tucked into the messy corner of our living room would have blown their freaking minds. And then to try to explain to them that I used to use the family's telephone to call another computer of a friend of mine as a way to interact even before we were going on the internet. I think all of those words would just sound confusing to them. And I'm also realizing as I'm saying all of this that probably there are some younger viewers of this video who are just confused by what I'm rambling about even right now. We're fundamentally not ready. Eventually, the battery life of this iPod degraded so much and the click wheel thingy stopped working. And I actually ended up having to buy the stupid U2 edition of this iPod because they were all sold out. And this was the only one that was available at the store at the time. But this version of the iPod had four times as much space and better battery life and was significantly improved from the precursor. A couple of years after this one was released, they ended up releasing one that was even smaller and it had like the ability to play videos. And while both of these devices are actually five gigabytes, you can just see the drastic difference in size. And I wanna say they're probably about four, maybe five years apart in release dates. Look, in just one of my hands, I am holding a perfect example of technological improvement and innovation. But if I go through my graveyard of technology here, I actually don't even have the original iPhone, but I have this iPhone. This right here was the iPhone 4. And actually, if you compare it to my iPhone of today, which is an iPhone 15, it's significantly smaller. But the leaps and bounds that this one had over my first iPhone, which was the very first iPhone issued, was crazy, but it looks like a joke compared to this iPhone. And anybody who's ever known a sense of FOMO when they see a new version of the iPhone come out knows what I mean, because at this point I have stacks of iPhones that each represent a significant improvement over the previous generation to the point when you look at the phone and how good it is today, it's almost as good as the camera that I'm using to shoot this video with. And that to me feels like the inevitability that's coming with the Apple Vision Pro. Because look at how stupid I look right now. So this right here is the Meta Oculus 2. So it's a VR headset it works okay. Like I remember when I first got it a couple of years ago, I thought it was incredible and I felt like I was like traveling to a different world and stuff. And I would go in there and play the games, but the games, some of them were okay, but a lot of them sucked. And when I went in there to interact with other people. I'm a big fan of yard sailing. Anybody else out there like yard sailing? That's right, that's right. That too always kind of sucked. It made me feel like a creep because it was pretty much just entirely populated with 11 year olds. Red flag dropped. You are jerk! You are jerk! Quit bothering me! And there is absolutely nothing more embarrassing than trying to play paintball with 11-year-old children. But up until a few months ago, this was some of the top technology that was out there at a consumer-grade level available for the VR experience. But now, when you compare the Oculus 2 to what the Apple Vision Pro is, this stuff just looks like junk that's going to be going into my inevitable box of old technology that I never ever use again and only bring out for demonstration purposes. Purposes. So I finally tried Apple's Vision Pro. After using it, 
I don't just think that Quest is the better value. I think that Quest is the better product. Period. Which I guess coming back to the point that I started this video with, I just kind of laugh when I see all of these naysayers out there saying that they are never going to buy an Apple Vision Pro and that they're never going to be headset wearing fools. Please don't knock over my soda girl. What they're really saying when they say that they're never going to buy an Apple Vision Pro is they're saying they're never going to buy this version of the Apple Vision Pro. They are not, nor have they ever been the early adopter types. The early adopters are usually some sort of combination of crazy rich, crazy curious, or clout chasers. And most people are not that, nor should they be, nor do I think trying to be that is healthy. In fact, it's taken me darn near 20 plus years to even try to confront my own personal problems with buying technology that I genuinely don't need, but have had my consumer-like brain wired to think that I need that latest upgrade or that newest thing. So I do not personally take any of those naysayers seriously. But what I do take very, very seriously and am very, very concerned about is what's this going to do to our society yet again? Oh, won't somebody please think of the children? You know, when I think about smartphone technology in general, it has completely changed our world in everything that we do, from relationships to communication, to business, to travel, to even how we purchase things at the store, the ways that we consume media, like all of that has radically changed because of this thing. And I, for one, don't necessarily think it's been for the better because of how the latest evolution of a new technology went. I genuinely believe having the internet in your pocket combined with the internet being a way that you primarily interact with other humans has been a bad thing for us and we've managed it the wrong way and we ceded so much of our control to techno corporate overlords and all of those things have probably made our society for the worse but it's absolutely been a double-edged smartphone you see because I think there's been some great advancements if I wasn't able to make long-winded videos like this and post it up on the internet I would probably be having to work a regular old job but instead I have the privilege of being being able to earn a living right here from my home. I think for me, the big concern is really centered on how is immersion in virtual worlds going to shape us as people, as well as how is using technology to give us Terminator vision going to change the way we interact with the world. Because I will tell you, just even in the basic rudimentary ways that I've been using AR and VR over the last couple of years, I have found it to have a profound impact on me personally. Despite finding the Oculus 2 pretty much worthless for personal interactions, I've found it to be exceptional for trying to find fitness activities that I like to do. Another thing that I've been doing for the last couple of years is every few months I go out with a 360 camera, which is like a video camera that has two lenses on it and basically a special software that stitches those two images together to create this big 360 degree view of of whatever you're recording. And I've gone out and recorded videos of myself doing chores on the farm. And while it's kind of fun to like watch a video like that, where if you're like watching it on the phone, you can just move the phone and you can look at a different place wherever I'm showing while I'm recording. The far more transformational experience is being able to immerse myself in a world that I will never ever be able to experience ever again. Like I can go back to videos that I shot in the summer of 2020 and I can see my livestock guardian dog Toby as a puppy and I can see all of my ducks and birds that I've had that have been dead for years. I can see things on the farm that I haven't even built yet, just not there and just see what the land looked like before I did a lot of the work, like built things like this barn. You know, a few months back, Ginny Barncat, who's this cat right here, her mother went missing and at this point I presume she's dead. But I have a 360 video that I can go back to and watch. And I gotta tell you, every time I watch that video, I cry like a small child for the cat that is gone. Rest in power, queen. And I know I'm probably overly attached to my animals and I'm probably a more emotionally expressive person than others, but I can't even imagine what that would be like to see a dead grandparent or a dead friend and to be able to see them again like that and be able to be immersed in a world where they're there. And when I think about just how poor the quality is of existing 360 cameras and existing VR headsets and think about some of the innovation that's gonna happen in the next couple of years, like I have said before, we are fundamentally not ready for what this is going to mean. 
Apple Vision Pro makes me question my soul. And all the conversations I've had with friends about this topic over the last few weeks has gotten wicked existential wicked quickly. Like, would you think that the introduction of the Apple Vision Pro would have you questioning what's your soul? Because it has me questioning what my soul is. Plato wrote fanfic about it. Stevie Wonder definitely has it. So much of our personal existence right now is baked into our digital lives. And I'm a generation who wasn't even born into the internet. I saw the introduction of the internet. And while it played a transformational role in my teenage years, the impact is completely negligible relative to what is done for folks who are, say, of Gen Z or Gen Alpha. When headset technology becomes so good that that's the way families primarily interact with each other or people primarily interact with the world, what the hell is that going to do to a kid or an adult for that matter? Or we're going to be able to do brain scans and take all of the information that's up here and put it into an AI model and then let that that essentially becomes something. I know that that concept has been done to death in science fiction, but this is absolutely a reality that we're like, I don't know, a few years away from. <laughs> Uncle Phil, come try this. I mean, just last week, OpenAI announced Sora, the new generative video platform they've been working on. I mean, you're able to just type some stuff in and you're able to get really good quality video. Just think about it. A year ago, this represented state-of-the-art cutting-edge text-to-video capabilities. And now we have this! This is simultaneously really impressive and really frightening. Like I can guarantee you that before I hit social security payout age, if social security payouts still exist, that that will be an option available to me. And I can like essentially claim to have immortality because my consciousness will never end. Today, we are taking the Apple mission to an entirely new plane of existence. Introducing I Immortal, a groundbreaking service that does more than just store your data. It preserves your consciousness, your memories, your soul, all in iCloud. Imagine a world where every 24 hours, you are backed up, ensuring that your essence, your very being, is immortal. So yesterday, I got a text message that told me that my data had been hacked and some hackers in Russia just stole my soul. I know that there's gonna be folks watching this video saying, no, 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 that's not true. That's not really how things work. Your soul is very different. But let's stop for a minute and talk about what's actually a soul. Most of us realize there's probably not a ghost that inhabits our bodies that lives on after we die. Probably, I don't know, quantum physics is weird. While I think you should probably watch CJ the X's entire video on this topic, and I'll leave a link for it down below. Science can tell us all at once, something, something, determinism, love is chemicals, you're an animal, but that's not how it feels and 100% of us agree on that. Let the soul be defined as the amalgamation of every part of us that contributes towards a hallucination of self and meaning. Simple enough, got it? So where does your soul exist? Consciousness is a thing, but I do not think we've settled the idea of whether or not consciousness has to exist only in one vessel. And while I personally feel like this is an issue of extreme magnitude and importance, I don't see anybody talking about this in a meaningful way. We're all too busy criticizing Casey Neistat for riding a skateboard. Rah, rah. And much like having the internet in your pocket mixed with the attention economy, algorithms, and social media created this dopamine cocktail that we are still addicted to and struggling with today. And I know I've talked at length in previous videos about artificial intelligence, but what's gonna happen when AI and virtual reality or augmented reality are gonna be able to work together to be able to create worlds that we can create and then occupy? Computer, load Mariner program all new to Olympic training facility. Wow, this is a very detailed program. Like when you put them all together, whoo, it's gonna be crazy. I don't even know how to pronounce this acronym, but I'm gonna call it VRARA here, just to maybe give it a label. That's not a word. Yeah, I'm gonna call it right now. The combination of VR, AR, and AI, or VRARA as I like to call it, is gonna be the big trend of 2024. And no, by no means is this actually me trying to do trend baiting. But yes, if any reporters would like to talk to me about it, I'm happy to explain how Vrara is going to take over the world. Gretchen, stop trying to make fetch happen. It's not going to happen. 
But I think Vrara is going to screw us all up in a big way. But then at the very same time, it's going to create some amazing things too. We're going to be able to connect with people in ways that we never could. We could show people the things that we're thinking. We can bring those things to life and not just like, you know, try to explain it with words like I'm doing a terrible job with today as I make this video. You know, a fundamental law of storytelling is to show and not tell. And I think Vrara is going to like completely give us the power to do that in a way that is just going to be mind blowing. And the incredible nature of Vrara is that it's going to make things so cool and so attractive that we're going to neglect the downsides and we're going to fall into that trap yet again. I think something like that's going to create a risk of social fragmentation where, again, like I said at the beginning, my worldview and what I'm seeing and experiencing on a daily basis is going to be so drastically different than what you're doing. Different worldviews. You know, I have family members who watch, I don't know if it's, it's, it's AOR or I don't, I don't even know what it's called, but it's like the off-brand version of Fox News that's like even more conservative than Fox News. Because the liberal media wants to give your country to an illegal immigrant. WKTT. We know the truth. Like they will watch that as their primary source of world information. The things that I see as facts and the things that I believe as part of my worldview just completely are inconsistent and create an extreme level of cognitive dissonance relative to their personal worldview. And at this stage, other than some mild pleasantries, we don't really communicate or connect because our worldviews are so different. And while I feel sad that that is the case, I also know it's probably for the best And I can't be alone in that. I imagine all of you watching this might think of a friend or family member who's gone down either a left wing or right wing rabbit hole that makes it virtually impossible or completely impossible to find some common ground to talk about. Is the Apple Vision Pro or Vrara gonna make that better or worse? And while our information sources are gonna shape our worldview and change how we see things, the other thing that's out there is, I actually think that AR and VR has the risk of completely shaping or distorting our memories. Like, yeah, you can be out there with a 360 camera and record this stuff. And if you have that record, then maybe it becomes a little bit less subjective. But if I have a memory where I'm looking at something with an AR headset and you have a memory where you're looking at something with an AR headset or you're immersed in a VR world while I'm talking to you, or I don't know how these interactions are going to work. But if we're both experiencing different realities at the same time, Who's got the true memory of something? I know the Rashomon effect will tell us that the truth lies in the subjectivity of the viewer of that truth, but we live in a post-fact world at this point, and I'm personally very concerned about our grip on those facts becoming even looser. The Unnatural World you know, the other thing I look at is when I look at kids these days and look at how they experience the world, in some way, I actually am fascinated and, and wildly impressed with how they are so able to intuitively navigate through technology and user interfaces in ways that my clumsy 40-something ass can't even comprehend. But at the same time, I see them struggling with things in the physical world in a way that makes me scratch my head. Like when a toy or a thing breaks, there's no back button or undo button. It's just physically broken. That is what it is. It's changed in the world. This is not meant to be a judgment, but that is definitely something I've seen young children struggle with in the last few years. And not just struggle with because they're upset that it's broken, but struggle with because they're struggling to understand the actual concept itself. You know, I was a kid who grew up on computers, and as a consequence of that, I feel like I had a very limited understanding of the physical world. I didn't really know how to use tools. I didn't really know how to fix things. I used to have to pay people to assemble my IKEA furniture. And one of the things I feel very lucky about is when I moved out to this farm and started this farm, it gave me the opportunity to interact with the physical world in a way that I'd never really had as an opportunity in other parts of my life. Whether it's propagating plants or taking care of animals or building structures or fixing things, like all of those interactions with the physical world, I feel like unlocked this unused part of my brain in a very meaningful way. And I know I'm gonna sound like an old fart as I say this, but I worry about those younger generations that if they are so embedded within virtual or augmented spaces, 
are they going to really know how to truly interact with the natural world? And how do we make sure that they don't lose those connections? Because I think those connections are just wildly important. And I do not say this as a Luddite. I say this as a lifelong tech loving early adopter. I believe in this stuff. I do think that this stuff can actually make the world better. I just have been working with this stuff long enough to know that there's always going to be a downside and there's always going to be a Faustian bargain. What's the solution? You know, throughout this video, I've been saying that these little glowing rectangles are like windows into the world. And, you know, I've also said that an AR or VR helmet is almost like a way to like fully immerse ourselves and go outside into that world. But the other thing that you got to remember is our eyes, our eyeballs. Yes, these things right here. These things are often thought to be the windows into a person's soul. And while it might be interesting to interact with and connect with people through a VR VR headset and you can bridge great distances and almost teleport to something. What's it going to be like to look into their eyes? What's it going to be like to look into that world? Are you going to still have that ability to look into their soul? Now, I know the question you guys are probably all wondering is, will I ever personally get an Apple Vision Pro? And all I can say to that is, well, what do you think? Whoa. <laughs> 